All right. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, and this talk is titled, So You Want to Rewrite That. Um, I, as you said, I am the head of engineering at Rent the Runway, and I just led my team through what I would call a successful uh, re-architecting of our system that took years and many hours of uh, people's time. So um, I wanted to talk about that, but I wanted to talk about it from a little bit more of a general perspective. Um, so, you know, when I joined Rent the Runway in 2011, the platform had launched in 2009. Um, it was a Drupal system. If you're familiar with Drupal, it's a PHP content management system. Um, totally unsuited to the task of building a website to support renting dresses and accessories to women, which is what Rent the Runway does. Um, and we had this Drupal platform that ran the storefront, it ran the inventory management, it ran fulfillment, it ran all of these sort of very complex things and all this sort of really awful, hacky PHP with HTML directly inside of it, just awful mess. Um, we basically, you know, had every single issue you can imagine with a legacy system. And we were failing, right? We could not support the growth of the company. We couldn't tolerate enough people being on the site at once to sort of do good marketing campaigns, right? We were failing to support our customers, despite the fact that the site was really slow and really clunky and, you know, broken in many ways a lot of the time. Somehow our customers kept coming back, but we really weren't supporting them well. Um, and we were failing to support our technology. Uh, the team couldn't deliver software. They were spending most of their time fixing bugs and firefighting. Um, so I spent the last two years, I joined in the, basically Cyber Monday of 2011, so you can imagine how exciting that was. Uh, and I spent sort of the two years after that, really going to the end of 2013, we were doing a major re-architecting and replatforming of our system. And through this process, I became really interested not just in the experiences that I was having with rewriting, but in the general experiences of rewriting. So this is not going to be a talk where I talk about exactly what I did and the technologies we used and why they're amazing and why you should do this. There are many of those talks out there. They are always interesting and always enlightening. But this talk is really more about some of the lessons that I learned and some of the things that I believe you can extrapolate from them. I spoke to a number of other people that have gone through similar exercises. Right? This is a very common thing for us to do as software engineers. So I spoke to a lot of people who have done this you know, several times in their careers about what they've learned in the process and tried to sort of create a talk for you that's a little bit more than just, this is what I did, to something that you will actually be able to think about, you know, whatever you're re-platforming or re-architecting is. Um, this is particularly sort of focused on the startup world because that's where I am and that's where a lot of people who need to rewrite go. But I think a lot of this is applicable to larger companies as well. So, you know, you're rewriting. You're rewriting because you're in a train wreck, right? Generally speaking, when you start a rewrite, this is sort of where you are. This is certainly where I was at Rent the Runway. We were just looking at this thing going, oh my god. How in the world did this happen? How did we get to this scenario? What do we do? And you think, oh, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to rewrite, and not only am I going to get out of this train wreck, I'm going to create this amazing, awesome bullet train. It's going to go 20 million times faster than my old system. It's going to get me out of this mess. But there's no such thing as a successful rewrite. This is from my friend Cliff Moon, who's the CTO of Boundary. He gave a talk recently and had this content as one of the slides. And I thought this was an amazing statement because I completely agree. There is no such thing as a successful rewrite. There is a sustainable rewrite, which looks a little bit like firefighting. But rewriting is basically an act born of failure. And so the best thing you can do is try to sort of mitigate failure and create yourself something that's a little more sustainable. So whether or not you believe me, Let's dive in. First things first, the path to rewriting is fraught with danger. Uh, rewriting successfully is really difficult because of where you are now, what you don't know, and the many sort of temptations there are along the path of a rewrite that will actually cause you to flounder. First things first, if you're rewriting, you are failing now. This is not necessarily a bad thing. But it is, generally speaking, the truth. If you need to rewrite, it should be because you are either failing really hard right now or you see the brick wall that you are headed towards that you are going to hit. Maybe you can't scale. 
We all know Twitter had some big scaling problems. They've written a lot about them. They've talked about the big rewrite that they had to do to get themselves out of the scaling mess that they were in because they had grown their platform on rails, on a giant monorail as they called it, um, which was very good for them in the early days and really did not scale. And if you were using Twitter a few years ago, you remember the days of the fail whale. Well, the days of the fail whale are no longer because Twitter did a big re-architecting to get themselves out of this mess. Um, being able to, not failing to scale is sort of the classic rewrite, and it's actually a great reason to rewrite. It's probably the best of the failures because it's really, really tangible, right? It's really easy to sell. People understand. It's like, oh yeah, like a site keeps crashing all the time. We can't accept new clients. We can't grow to, you know, doing more things with our business because we can't scale. Um, Rent the Runway's problem with scaling when I joined was that we were on a version of Drupal where when somebody logged in, you had a sticky session to the server that you were on. And by the way, we were a closed site, so you always had to log in. So what would happen? Well, we couldn't cloud scale our systems. Um, that's not great, right? When you want to be able to put promotional traffic against your website and scale up and scale down, you know, you want to be in that sort of dynamic cloud world, we could not do this. So we had a fundamental problem with our architecture that we could not scale easily. We would have to just allocate servers. That's not a good place to be. You may be failing because you can't meet customer demand. Related to scaling, but slightly different, right? Um, uh, somebody recently wrote an interesting article with HipChat where HipChat was built to, uh, to run in like sort of the cloud native world, right? It was built, I think it was, you know, directly tied into various Amazon services, which is awesome, great for that kind of software, but then they needed to be able to go enterprise native. They needed to be able to basically be installed within the four walls of an enterprise. And all of a sudden, they couldn't do that because they were, had all the software that was relying on things that were built into Amazon. So they had a problem that they had to rewrite their way out of, right? Because they could not meet the customer demand. Uh, you know, we couldn't scale to meet our customer demand because we had some bad data models, right? So our reservation system was just sort of a hack, right? It meant that we actually weren't getting maximal utility out of our inventory. We couldn't really add more inventory easily, so we couldn't create enough you know, stuff for us to be able to rent to meet our customer demand. This was a big problem for us, another reason why we had to rewrite. The final failure, and the most dangerous and questionable and tricky one, is of course that you're crushed under the weight of your own technical debt. Uh, you can barely do anything, right? You spend all of your time fighting fires. 90% of your developer's effort is fixing production, stabilizing production, keeping the patient alive. This is, of course, danger, 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 right? Because we're all developers, or I'm sure many of you are developers here in the audience, right? We always kind of want to rewrite the software, right? Le if you didn't write it yourself, Legacy software is, uh, do I really have to understand that? I don't, I don't know that system all that well. I didn't write this. This isn't my baby. Can I just, you know, like abandon it and create a new one? Uh, so this is more than just like, oh, I get a little slowed down when I have to figure out how this system that I didn't write works. That's not a great reason for a rewrite, even though a lot of us will probably do some rewriting based on that. Uh, but if you are actually crushed, under the weight of the technical debt, which my team definitely was. We literally just couldn't do anything. We would try to release, and we'd have to release and roll back and release and roll back. They probably released, I think, in 2011, they released maybe six things. Uh, compare that to 2012 and 2013, where every single year we released more and more and more and more. We now release our website every single day. Um, not always with new features, but certainly much, much, much more frequently and much more successfully. But that required a major rewrite for us to be able to get that done. So you're failing. You want to rewrite, but it's really easy to fail a rewrite on the unknown unknowns. Um, because you're in the midst of failure, and you're probably spending a lot of your time firefighting what's going on right now. So how much time do you have to spend planning to pull off a su successful rewrite? Because rewrites aren't easy, right? How well do you really know what this gigantic system that's existed for some period of time and is presumably serving someone's needs, how well do you know what it's actually doing? Um, Drupal, right? We had this giant Drupal system that had been written by teams of PHP developers that had turned over. We did not have a lot of existing experts on our team. So we had a giant system whose expertise lived basically in the mind of our original product manager who had been with the company for the entire, its entire history. So she knows everything that's going on really well, but that's not 
you know, that's not great, right? If it's one lives in one person's mind at best, and she doesn't know all those details and all those hacks. The truth of the matter is, you know, systems get stronger and bigger just for, by virtue of living in production, right? They accumulate years of hacks and band-aids and fixes and improvements that it's very hard to really know what they all are. Even though you have the code in front of you, you know, you've got a big code base you're trying to rewrite. How well do you really know what it's doing? Uh, the other thing about rewriting, especially in a startup world, is usually the system as it started, right, was, was you had no customers. So if things were broken and things weren't working right, there weren't that many people to complain. Or they were early adopters, so they were really patient with you, right? Early adopters are famously sort of patient with bugs. They really think the product is interesting. They're willing to tolerate some quirkiness. If you're rewriting and you're moving into sort of the middle part of your adoption curve, all of a sudden people are going to be much less tolerant of, oh, this thing that used to work all of a sudden just is totally broken for me for a while. What's going on? So you have a much less tolerant customer base using the software that you want to rewrite. Um, my story on this is that we did a couple of days hackathon. Actually, before I joined the team, they did a two-day hackathon. And I remember being told it was awesome. What they did was they were like, we're going to see how far we can get with completely rewriting the site in this period. And I swear they were like, oh, yeah, we got like halfway through. Absolutely no way did they get halfway through. They may have gotten 5% through. They sold themselves a story that was motivating and in some ways good. But the truth of the matter is when you're just sort of looking at something that you don't know all that well and trying to rewrite it, you do all the easy stuff. But you don't think about things like administrative tools, data migration, uh, you know, performance, right? You just say, oh, well, I'm writing it in a new language. Of course it's going to be more performant. Not true. What about the data, by the way? If you are creating, modifying, touching data, it is a mystery. It is a black box. There's no image here because you probably don't really know it that well. But you really, really rely on it, right? How do you know that your new system is writing the correct data without writing a big reconciliation or a big migration effort? Most modern companies have big analytics teams. And if you're talking about a startup especially, they're probably just relying directly on the data as it's being written by the existing system. So you can't just say, oh, I'm just going to junk all that and move over here. What about all that historical data? We need to know how our business is doing. You can't just junk it and move over there. I've never had a project that involved data changes or data migration or even just writing data, changing the place where data was written from one thing to another, be anywhere near easy. So planning for the data is a huge risk in doing any kind of a rewrite. Finally, how does the team need to change to make this successful? Because you alone are probably not enough. When I started this effort, I was full of vim and vigor, and I was like, oh, this is fine. No big deal, right? I can write this code to make it more scalable and more supportable. I'm a great engineer. I'm a great software developer. Not necessarily untrue, but I'm not the only person writing code. In fact, I'm one of very, you know, I'm one of many, right? I'm writing less and less code as time goes on as I'm managing more and more and more people. So if you're going to actually change your software and expect a better outcome in the end, your team has to change in some way. You either need to train the people there in a new language or a new platform or simply better development practices, like how do you write tests? How do you deploy continuously? How do you think about staging features, right? Uh, you may need more operations people if you're going to build out a SOA platform, which is what we ended up going to. Probably at some point you need a little bit more operations somewhere in the mix, or some people at least thinking about operations, right? Um, if you have experts, by the way, on staff that are paying attention to the old system while you rewrite the new system, who's making sure that the new system is doing the right thing? If you don't, then who's making sure that the old system is still moving along? So the team probably needs to change in some ways that you haven't really thought through very much to actually make a rewrite successful. And you know, you might luck, th luck your way through it, but this is actually a really big challenge of any rewrite. Finally, there are many things, there are many temptations that are going to set you off course. Um, so many quick fixes that are simply not quick. Trying to do too much at once. Um, this is the death of rewrites. Um, here is my story for this from our experience. The very first thing that we did was try to rewrite our reservation system because it's such a core, important part of the business. And I remember being told right around when I signed up, but I hadn't joined yet, oh, it's awesome, we've got this new data model, it's great, it's going to be so killer for the business. It's going to take like six weeks of time. Six weeks, one developer, no big deal. 
Five months and about 10 developers later working on a death march, the system was finally done and integrated. So order of magnitude worse uh, in actual implementation. Why? Because we not only moved logic from Drupal into a Java service, we completely changed the data model and we completely changed the logic. So now we're trying to figure out, is this right versus what we used to have? How do we know that it's correct and how do we not know that it's correct? Is the bug in the Drupal? Is it not calling the right thing? Is the bug in the Java? Is the bug in the data model? Who knows? All I know is that trying to do too much and giving into the temptation of, oh yeah, we can add this feature, that feature, this other feature, because you've got this product manager or this business person saying, can you just give me a little more with this, is a huge temptation. Um, and it almost always, it can really very easily sync a rewrite. <sighs> We're lazy. I don't want to have to think about how I'm actually going to stage this rewrite. So what I'm going to do, we're just going to run the old system. We're going to spend six months, a year, two years, three years, writing a whole new thing. And then when it's ready, we're just going to flip a switch and turn the new one on, turn the old one off. Yeah, right. You're just basically being lazy about planning up front and relying on your brilliance to get you through the end. But the likely outcome here is actually that you're just going to take a lot longer at the end because everything's going to be wrong and you might flip that switch a whole bunch of times before you actually get it right. Finally, you must choose wisely the software that you use. I am not going to tell you what software I think is good or what software I think is not because that is very risky. Um, but I will say that I think a lot of times it's very tempting to say in your rewrite, oh, we're going to choose X, Y, or Z, cool new language, cool new software platform. It'll help us with recruiting. It will make us seem like this dynamic, new, awesome team. And that is very risky because just in the same way that your production software has you know, gotten better-ish over the years of being in production, existing languages and platforms gain production hardening over the years. Uh, I still use Java for a reason because Java is a language that's gotten a lot of production hardening over the years and I trust that you know, it's going to do right by me. Um, choosing for vanity reasons is risky. We actually you know, made one mistake in this way, um, which was we used the very original Play framework. So Play has moved on to a 2.0 version that I know nothing about. But they had this original 1.0 version, which was sort of supposed to be like Rails for Java, which already should have raised red flags, but you know. Um, and we wrote some of our original services in this. Well, you know, fast forward to like six months into the project and the Play community has moved on to 2.0. It's not quite production ready, but they've moved on. And we've got issues that we don't really know how to figure out. It's a very complex code base, so we didn't feel like we could just support it ourselves. Um, this is now, you know, our, this is now the bane. This is the thing that all my developers are like, can we please rewrite this? Can we please? I don't want to learn play. We moved on to Drop Wizard for most of our new services, but we still have some old things written in play. And this was an unwise choice for us, unfortunately. Uh, because, you know, as the right software can give you life, the wrong software can take it away. So be careful when choosing. Don't just be led by, you know, hotness, newness, the value of recruiting. I think people overvalue that a lot. Plus, you really don't want to have to teach, not only hire people because they think a language is cool, but then have to teach them a new cool language. If you have no one on your team that knows it, you want to hire experts in it. You don't want to hire people that are like, oh, I love language X. I've heard so much about it. I want to join you and learn language X. That's, that's just another risk. All right, so rewriting is full of fail, fail, fail. You're failing, failing, failing. It's, it's, it's bad. But you're going to do it. We're all going to do it at some point in our careers, at least once, if not several times. So given that this is a generic problem of software engineering, and everyone's going to do it, there should be some principles that we can all apply to actually making this successful, right? Let's figure out what those principles are. Principle number one is change as little as possible, right? Uh, what did Cliff say on that earlier slide? He said that a sustainable rewrite looks like firefighting. Uh, change as little as possible means find where the fire is blazing the hottest and put it out in the simplest way, if at all possible. Maybe you can just modify in place. Maybe you can just slap a coat of paint on the jalopy or switch out the engine and get along that way. That's not the worst idea, right? 
there are plenty of software platforms that actually it's not fundamentally, it's not like the fundamental platform you're using is not going to support you, right? Maybe the fundamental platform you're using would support you fine. But the way that you've written your code in it is simply not supportable. So stop all forward progress, go into that code base, figure out what needs to be done, what fires need to be put out, put them out, and put your team on the right track. This is beneficial to do even if you decide you ultimately need to do a full rewrite because the the fewer fires that are actively burning when you have to do that rewrite, the easier your job's going to be. One great thing that my team did before we started our rewrite um, was that we spent a lot of time tuning a bunch of database queries that were just poorly written and really hadn't been thought about. That meant that the old Drupal system was slightly more stable while we were undergoing all these various pieces of rewrites, which was good for us because we were less distracted by production fires. So even if you can't, even if you do need to rewrite, Spending a little time firefighting what you have right now is actually a very beneficial exercise to do in the beginning. You could just rewrite and keep the language the same. So maybe you have a crufty old Spring framework. Spring, it does not have to be crufty, but you know, if you wrote something 10 years ago, it's probably got a lot of stuff in it. Maybe you want to move it to something simpler like Drop Wizard or one of the new Java frameworks. Uh, you know, maybe you're in Drupal and you should move to a better PHP framework instead of throwing away all your PHP. Why would you do this? Because moving languages means that you are dividing the knowledge base in your team. And that, again, is always risky. You're already in a fragile situation. Now you're dividing your knowledge base. You probably don't have people that are fluent, truly fluent in both of the languages that you want to use. So it's easier to salvage code and knowledge if you don't completely change languages, if you just rewrite but in, a, in the same language in a better framework. Finally, you can boil the frog, salami slice, whatever. Change only one thing at once. Uh, if there is one thing you take away from this talk, please let it be this, because I would say that I failed in pretty much every way that I say you can fail in this talk, except for this one thing, which was that we changed only one thing at once, and that saved the project, in my opinion. What do I mean by this? So we had this Drupal platform, I've said, said several times. We hollowed out the business logic out of that Drupal platform, turned it into API calls into Java services. We did this data type, core data type by core data type, core page by core page. And we would integrate it into Drupal. And then, generally speaking, we would maybe even add a couple features. And then we do another one, integrate, add a couple features. Eventually, our Drupal layer had become a very thin level of just sort of API calls, at which point we started moving out of Drupal completely and we moved into a thin Ruby client that from the get-go was never allowed to talk to any of the data stores. That was key because I didn't want the business logic and the data store and data access logic living in what I essentially consider the client layer. right? So because we did this in piece by piece and page by page, we were able to iteratively release it and we were able to actually add features without adding features exactly at the same time as we were doing the rewrite, right? So you would rewrite, add feature, rewrite, add feature. This is the best way to do, I mean, iterative is the best way to do any project, right? We live in you know, the 21st century, we've all learned that lesson. Agile may or may not be the best thing in the world, but the, the, the concept of agility, meaning being able to do things sort of constantly, is a very, very, very valuable thing. So you wanna do that when you're doing any kind of a rewrite. You need to sell it. Um, we don't talk a lot about the sort of soft side of tech, I don't think. Um, talk a lot about like, oh, these are the tech choices I made, blah, blah, blah. Look, if you are rewriting, if you're proposing a rewrite or a re-architecture, you should know that you are in a very politically precarious situation and people lose their jobs over failed rewrites all the time. So you better have a lot of confidence that this is the right thing to do and best if everybody else agrees this is the right thing to do. Seems obvious, and yet we don't always do it. Sell it to yourself first. Find your most skeptical friend. I'm sure you know someone who's like, rewrites are a terrible idea. Um, if I were ever doing this again, I am friends with Kellen, who is the CTO of Etsy, and he hates rewrites. And I would go to him and be like, shoot holes in this. Why am I doing this? Ask all the questions. Be the most skeptical person you can be. I'm sure you have a friend like that. I'm sure you have someone on your team like that. Get all of those skeptics around you and make sure you really believe that this is the right thing you're doing. Again, your job might be on the line if it's not. All right, so you believe in it. 
sell it to the business, whoever the business is, right? Somebody in your company doesn't do tech and somebody needs to be convinced that this is the right thing to do. The best way to sell to that group is through big scary graphs, right? You have a hockey stick of infrastructure costs. If we don't enable ourselves to cloud scale, we're just gonna spend a bajillion dollars on Oracle, right? Very clear. We have a flat line of developers we're able to add. We can't add more developers. We can't add more features because any developer we add just drops productivity because they have to learn the new system and it's a disaster. Uh, we have a you know, cliff of performance for our customers, right? Oh, you get more than 100 people on the site, <laughs> their performance goes to crap, right? These big, big scary graphs you know, should be easy to find if you need to rewrite, even if you need to do a tech debt rewrite. Big scary graph around the complexity of your code, around the lines of CSS, around whatever. Um, but these also provide you with some metrics that you're going to look at throughout the course of the rewrite to make sure you're on the right track. Finally, of course, your team are the ones that have been working their asses off to make this happen. And they're the ones that are, gonna be, that are gonna, actually going to work their asses off to get you out of this train wreck, right? So you need to sell it to them. They need to be on board. I think as leaders, we sometimes forget that our team needs to understand why we're doing, what the clear goals are. They need to be bought in. If possible, put them in, put them as part of the process of choosing what you're rewriting to. Have them bought in to the idea that we're going to do this and we all agree that this new thing we've chosen is the right way to go. When I did this, we actually, I actually said, are you guys sure we want to get rid of PHP for Ruby? And they came up with a very, you know, compelling argument. Most of the people on the team were actually Ruby developers that had been hired. Um, they sort of knew PHP, but we didn't have a lot of PHP experts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They sold that part of it to me. Um, and that, I think, really helped keep them motivated and invested in making the rewrite successful. You need a detailed definition of done, of course. This can go on forever. A rewrite can go on forever. Software is never perfect. It's never complete. It's never really done. So when do you declare victory? Best case, you have a test suite that exists now or that you're going to write that's actually going to act as a safety harness for you. So you know how far along you've come. You, you, know, you have a set of selenium tests or something sort of at the edges that you can easily run against the old system and the new system and see where it's, where it's working and where it's not, right? Uh, this is just a very, uh, that helps you uncover some of your unstated assumptions and catch some of those comp compatibility problems that you're going to be hitting. Again, those big scary graphs, you need these. You probably want these to measure the quality you're trying to improve. This is one of my big mistakes is I didn't really do this. We were so clearly failing. I didn't really need to sell this to the business. So I didn't bother to take any metrics of like code quality. Well, again, I was sort of, you know, assuming, oh, I am a great engineer, I'm a great architect, it'll just get better. Truth of the matter is, some of parts of my system got better, especially from a tech debt perspective, and some of them did not. Some of them are only better because the developers that rewrote them are still with the company, and if they were to leave and we were to replace them with all new developers, we probably they'd probably be complaining almost as much as the Drupal developers are complaining. So, you know, if you're not measuring what you're trying to improve, you're probably not actually improving it. Again, data migration. Data, data, data. It's a painful thing. If you've never done it, if you've never done it, you underestimate it, right? This needs to be planned in the beginning. When are you cutting over? Are you going to dual write? Are you going to do a reconciliation? Uh, you know, how do you know you're actually doing the right thing? What about the analytics team? Are they bought in? How do you do your backfill if you're going to change your data structure? Yada, 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 yada. You cannot underestimate data migration as a hugely complex part of a rewrite. All right. So you have to rewrite. You've got your principles in place. What does the outcome of this exercise look like? First things first, your culture is going to change. Um, again, the softer side of tech, the thing that we don't talk about that much, that we don't think about that much, but that's actually pretty important. You may have people that are going to feel threatened by the act of rewriting. The people that wrote the code in the first place, if they're still around, they may think, what do you mean this thing I wrote is shit? Right? What do you mean this thing I wrote is not good enough for this team anymore? Right? Nobody likes to hear that the system they sweat, shed blood, sweat, and tears over 
is no longer the system that we want to use. It's just a threatening thing. I have felt threatened by people saying, oh, I don't want to use your system that you wrote anymore. We've written this, our own best thing. And they're like, well, what about this? What about that? Did you think about this? Did you think about that? You know, people feel threatened when you say you're going to rewrite their work. They may feel threatened because they don't know whether they're going to be able to get work done in the same world. They may feel like they're being, you know, they're being uh, eclipsed by new people. And you may lose them, and that's even riskier, right? If you start to lose all those people that are experts in the old system, who's going to tell you what you're doing wrong? You're going to have to sort of trial and error it. So this is something I think people really underestimate, but is actually really important, especially when you're talking about a startup going from sort of its V1 to V2. Your workflows are probably going to have to change in some way. You're rewriting your software. It's going to be something new. It'll either be more complex or, you know, look, you, you had probably had poor process to get yourself in the situation you're in now. Maybe your process will simplify greatly, right? Maybe you'll actually be able to get rid of those sort of middle tiers. Adrian talked about this a lot in his keynote this morning, right? Getting rid of those middle tiers of like, oh, well, we've got to get people in the data center to rack hardware and, you know, get agreement on our buying plan. And that's, and that's great. And then you can simplify your process. But, you know, a lot of times, especially when you're talking about an early stage startup where it's like, Oh, we wrote this whole thing in Rails, which meant that our product manager or business person could go over to developer over there, tap him on the shoulder and be like, hey, Timmy, can you just put this feature there? Can you just do this little thing for me? And, you know, a few hours or a few days later, that little thing was just done, right? All of a sudden, you, maybe you need to actually have some process to support the fact that, hey, you know what? Actually, we've got a big, complex website. We can't just have somebody run off over there and make a tiny change and you know, all of a sudden they're done, right? So your process is probably going to change in some way, and you, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to predict this. The structure of your team is also probably going to change. Lots of startups are super, super flat. You've got a bunch of full stack developers. Maybe you have a CTO and an architect or a VP of engineering. Um, now you've got this crazy hierarchy, and I, you know, I'm not very good with PowerPoint, so I probably didn't go even deep enough, but you've got different directors, different teams, you've got a bigger operations team than you ever had before because somebody has to support all that sort of DevOpsy stuff. Um, you have silos, right? Again, it doesn't have to happen, but it's very likely that if you build a new platform, this definitely happened to us, right? We went from a team of full stack developers, we built out a SOA-based system, um, and all of a sudden we had sort of the front end devs and the back end devs. And we reorganized so that the front end devs and the back end devs were in their own little groups and they were able to work on business problems together, but the team got a lot more complex um, as a result of the rewrite. So this structure is, change is almost certainly going to happen. A new architecture is going to bring new challenges. Again, nothing is perfect. Nothing is ever, you know, what you expect it to be. It's very tempted to make your V2 perfect, make your V2 able to do everything. It's everything and sliced bread. You know, they call this second system syndrome or second system effect, right? First system was pretty good, but it had some problems. Our second system is going to be awesome. It's going to be perfectly scalable. It's going to be you know, we're going to add all these abstractions. So if, if we want to do this, we can do it super easily. Oh, if we want to, like, make it horizontally scale out to 100,000 machines, no problem, we can do it. Uh, you know, as one of my teammates puts it, you can't boil the ocean, but you can cause global warming, right? Uh, it's really tempting to do everything. Um, in particular, it's also tempting to over-engineer your process. Oh, well, we really need to have all these checks and balances in place so that we can do X, Y, and Z. And the example I have here is one of the biggest mistakes we made in our re-architecting was we decided to do this thing called swim lanes, which is a great concept and a very useful concept. And what it is is you have different parts of your site, if you're talking about like a consumer-facing website, where they are separately sort of written and deployed, which means you can scale them independently. So you scale your checkout differently from your product pages. Uh, you can, you know, work on them independently. You can have a team that owns checkout and a team that owns product detail and a team that owns your home page. Um, you know, you can have them fault tolerant isolation, right? So you have this fault isolation. If the home page breaks, everything else still works. We tried to do this with our Ruby layer not really thinking very carefully about the fact that, in fact, it was all using a bunch of shared services. And so for the most part, everything was broken if one of those shared services was broken. We said, oh, but we'll still try this for the Ruby layer. 
Well, this was a disaster for us. We ended up with these Git submodules that had to be synced. This was like the complexity of just our thin client Ruby that doesn't even talk to the database at all. This is just talking to backend services. And we had all these different sort of Git submodules. A release took six hours, and you were syncing all these things to those things. We were deploying in different places so that we could, again, be fault tolerant and isolated. So, oh, if you know, Rackspace goes down, we're still in Heroku, we're still in this, we're still in that. This was a disaster, and it required basically three months of a team going in and really recombining all this stuff and putting a bunch of tooling around our, uh, around our deployment process to turn this into now it's a six minute daily deploy. But in the process of our rewrite, we created this little piece of technical debt by over-architecting for something that we didn't need. We didn't need this level of scalability, flexibility, and fault isolation. In fact, we were sort of faking ourselves out to thinking that we even had it with this. We really didn't. So, you know, this is the way that we failed in these, in these instances. You'll probably find, you know, many other ways you can fail, but it's really easy to sort of over-architect yourself to deal with some of these fault cases that you've been dealing, that you had pains with in the past. You're never really done, of course. The Springfield tire fire is always burning. Uh, you can try to hose it off, but it's going to be relit, right? We declared done when our interactive Drupal facing pages were off of uh, Drupal, right? We, we declared done at that point, which was great. We still have a ton of admin functionality that needs to be moved out. It's very painful. It takes a really, really long time, right? Now, as I mentioned earlier, my developers want to get out of play. They don't like all those old play services. They want to move all of them into, into Drop Wizard. You're never really done with one of these rewrites. It's only just getting yourself to a point where you are able to be much more incremental is really the goal here. So hopefully, at the end of all this effort, you've created a system that will last longer than its predecessor. How much longer? I don't know, probably not twice as long, even though I think that's the goal we all sort of put in our minds. Oh, it's Moore's Law. We're going we're gonna to last twice as long. Two is nice. We're engineers. That's what we like. It's probably not going to last twice as long. Hopefully, you build something that has the flexibility to have the things you really need, right? So if you need to scale, you better build something that has the flexibility to scale to more than twice the load that you have now. Because in two years, you're probably, your load is hopefully not growing by twice. It's hopefully doubling several times. If you're a successful business, that's the goal, right? Um, hopefully you have the flexibility to add new features and products more easily. Again, this is what you need. You're rewriting because you can't do these things. So you're hopefully creating a system that is actually, you know, flexible. However, um, again, another way that I failed in this, Putting standards around that flexibility is important if you want to mitigate the complexity that flexibility brings, right? Levels of abstraction are great and painful all at the same time, and every time you add one, it takes a while iterating through that level before it's actually something that everybody really gets and understands. Uh, so, you know, for example, right, SOA services, microservices, what have you, um, are great, it's a great model. That's a model that I use. Um, but you need some kind of an API, right? And here's a mistake I made. Our API, we're using REST, but we didn't really make it a RESTful API for some of the early services. We're just like, ah, oh, whatever. I'm an RPC person by you know, history. So I don't care what they're named. It should be just be named whatever. It makes sense enough. Wrong, 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 right? I didn't bother to think about the standards. And as a result, now it's just harder for people to understand what's going on. They're not as self-documenting. So loose coupling really requires standardization to make it effective. Um, this can also be, you know, middleware, right? Middleware is actually kind of great. I mean, it's a different point of failure, but middleware can be a very productive thing. But if you have no standards around the way you use your middle middleware, if you don't have people writing clients, if you don't have a standardized way of generating DTOs, data transfer objects, things get hairy very quickly. Um, having a uniform way to do concurrency, to think about your network, to do metrics, to do monitoring, all of these things are really important. Uh, if you're going to put a lot of flexibility in to mitigate the complexity that comes with that flexibility. Finally, when you're doing this build, hopefully you build with the needs of a smaller or a larger team in mind. Um, there could probably be a whole talk about you know, rebuilding for smaller teams, right? 
That's a very useful thing to do. And in fact, this is a reason that you should write rewrite software at some point, because it requires 10 or 20 or 100 people to support something that really should only require a very small team to be running. Um, if you're rewriting for that reason, it's going to be a very different process. And if you're rewriting because you have 10 or 20 people on the ground now, and you expect to have 100 or 200 in a couple of years, uh, microservices and the services sort of model is very useful for thinking about, great, I'm going to have 200 people. How am I going to make them able to be independently effective? Um, okay, I'm going to create sort of these very easy to see divisions and I'm going to create a model where you can easily add new things and spin things up. You can also though do this in the monolith world, at least to some extent, uh, if you have really, really great continuous deployment. There's a lot of tooling required to make that happen. But if you have a monolith that is deploying very, very frequently, is, has really good operations and tooling around it, you can actually put a lot of people on that code base and they can be pretty productive. Um, Hard to do though. Both of those cases actually have their trade-offs. Both of those cases actually, for the most part, they just need more thinking about ops, DevOps, whatever, those tools around the, around the either the continuous deployment, the microservices, both, are actually pretty hard to build. And that's a big thing that you have to think about if you're gonna grow your team to 200, you probably need a lot more operations support in this architecture. So, everything's not fine and you need to rewrite and what are you gonna do? You know it's time to rewrite. So sell it, change as little as possible, know what done looks like, prepare for a brave new world. Your architecture is not gonna be perfect, your team's gonna change, your culture's gonna change, your process is going to change in ways that you may or may not anticipate. But hopefully you create something sustainable that comes out of this, right? Hopefully at the end of the day, you've created yourself a more sustainable future that has the flexibility that you need. And that is it. Thank you very much. I have the obligatory I'm hiring slide, but um, I would love to chat with any of you. Also, uh, feel free to tweet me at Scamille on Twitter. If you have any questions, don't get to catch me. Um, and I have a blog, which is whatever, and a few photo credits. And that's it. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone wants. I know it's lunchtime. You're probably all starving. <laughs>